Good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 16-week Adoption Parent Coaching and Certification Session 12. This morning, we are going to get into, uh, we're going to wrap up the understanding what works and why by talking about uh, limits, because I think that's where we left off. And then we're going to get into the, the family dynamics um, aspect of the talk and kind of start picking into that a little bit. Now, in the, in the next couple weeks after this, the next couple of sessions, we're going to get into the coaching. So that's kind of what we're going to move into, move into this, uh, this class this morning. I had some a good, really good responses to, to the last quiz, especially that question, do you believe that love and fear are the primary emotion? Some really good responses to that. So I probably will spend maybe even the next session, because um, I don't have all of that, haven't thought through all of those enough yet, but I'll probably spend some of the next session kind of talking about that, because to me there is a, there's a mindset that goes into understanding the primary emotions. And yes, there is science behind stress and fear. Uh, yes, there is science behind love. Um, but I think that more than anything, it is when we start to make, this is, I'm sorry, if, some, if I all of a sudden um, go like there's no, you can't hear me, would someone please just uh, hit me a, like pop up the little question sign because I can't always tell when I'm working from here and before I've gotten kicked off and and didn't know it so I want to I want to know you know as fast as possible but I I believe that there is a a a, a very important dynamic that goes into not overthinking these dynamics not overthinking um, love and fear, not overthinking any feeling, not overthinking any behavior. See, that's, that's the beauty of, of the, the stress model. That's the beauty of love-based parenting. That's the beauty of love. Love doesn't ask you to make anything complicated. I mean, it, it's just, just believe in the power of love. I mean, it's just have faith and seek understanding. But don't overthink it. When you start overthinking it, and then we can get into the brain discussing this, but when you start overthinking it, you are bordering on being stressed or stressing yourself out. You are going to border on stepping into dysregulation. When you start to try to think about, well, why is this happening, and what caused it, and what feeling is this, and how is this feeling really fear? Now, you can ask yourself those questions regarding your own, your own behavior, your own dynamics. You know, you should ask yourself on a regular basis, and that's really the key. You should ask yourself on a regular basis is how is this fear? I remember I presented in the UK. Um, well, actually, it was, I presented at an attached conference in Greenville, South Carolina. It's the last one that I ever presented at. It's probably 10 years ago. And Sir Richard Bowlby was there, and some of you may know that name. Others of you may not, but he is uh, the son of John Bowlby, who is the father of attachment. So even though Richard is not a psychologist, he has made it a part of his life's work to continue on uh, discussing his father's work and his research and, and being a part of the psychology community, the attachment community, um, just as, you know, because that's essentially his birthright with his father being the, the father of attachment. Um, he was in the audience that day, and, you know, at the end of the presentation, he came up and he said he really did enjoy it. We exchanged numbers. And so he went back home, and, and eventually, a few months later, six months later, maybe even the next year, I can't remember, he was, um, I was going over to the UK, so I sent him an email and, and let him know I was heading over there, and he had written a foreword for Heather and I for our Beyond Consequences, Logic, and Control, so we had, you know, started exchanging emails and being in touch with one another, and he invited me over to his house, so we went over one afternoon, and he was, we were sitting there talking, 
and he said he had had Alan Shore sit in the same in the same chair and and have the kind of same conversation that he and I were was about to have. And he said he really enjoyed just having that discourse. And I told him he should be videoing those when uh, these different theorists and clinicians and everything come over because I'm sure it would be just excellent, fascinating content. Um, he said when he heard my talk, he came back and he, he had never thought about, you know, the two primary emotions, love and fear. And he was telling his wife, Exania, about it. And they were watching television. And he was thinking, what, where is the fear in this? And he was asking himself that as he was watching these different television shows in these different situations. So what could possibly be the fear in this? And he said, as I started asking myself that question. He said, I started to see it. I really started to see it. It was quite profound. And I just want to, you know, I just, I want you to, it's important. You know, for me, it's important because I believe that fear and stress are interchangeable. But ultimately, I believe it's important that you just not overthink it. You, and that's the problem with psychologists. Once you start overthinking it, you start stressing out your brain. Once you start stressing out your brain, your thinking becomes confused and distorted. Your short-term memory is suppressed. You don't use any common sense anymore. And then you're, you're trying to, you know, then you start trying to figure out all these um, different parenting tools and techniques and, and, and therapy techniques that you can use on this child and their behavior. And you just stop remembering that this child is just longing for love and connection. This child is just longing for acceptance and certainty and security and significance. And we, we come up with all this crap based on all of our overthinking these really simple problems. It is really not that difficult. It's Occam's razor. In, in most situations, the simplest answer is the most accurate one. You know, it's the simplest answer is the most accurate, but we want to make it all difficult. So just wanted to share a little uh, food for thought for you. So let's get on into this morning and discuss, let's see, where do we go? We guess last, last week we discussed mindfulness, understanding, emotional flexibility, and matching, awareness, being aware of uh, uh, affection, attunement, time in. Containment, both emotional and environmental. 10-20-10, three-phase intervention. Setting effective limits is where we left off, and that's where I want to pick up this morning. And I, I left off there because I felt like it, it was probably more deserving of the time and the energy that I was um, prepared to give in the last class. So. We all the time talk about setting limits with kids. But here's the problem with setting, setting limits. The reason we fail to set effective limits with children is for one very reason. It's parental guilt. And what we don't realize is we don't set limits for our children. We set limits for, oops, <laughs> for ourselves as parents. So not for our children, but rather for ourselves. Because setting limits is a process of teaching your child but at the same time, if you operate from a premise of taking responsibility, you're not doing it to the child. You're not doing it for the child. You're doing it for yourself as the parent to create a, a containment of you, if you will, it, from the moment to moment of what's going on, you know, what's what the growth process, the needs for your child. Now, here's the thing. When we set a limit, when we set a limit for a child, look, just hang on just a minute, guys. Look at the, he's, she's tearing up that plastic bag, and she's going to eat up your stuff. I'm sitting here pointing at my mom, 
like, look at the door, look at the door. She stands up. She's like handing me dog treats and you asking me if I want the door closed. I'm like, no, just look, just look out, out the door. <laughs> now she figured it out. All right. So when we set a limit for a child, let's don't leave the yard. That's a limit. You can walk, you can play your computer for let's see that's probably that's probably a better example. You can play your computer for 2 hours. And then after that it's going to be turned off. So when we get into allowing the child to be on the computer for the two hours. You have to go into this with the understanding that nine times out of ten, the child is not going to get off, is not going to want to get off of the computer after two hours. They are going to be resistant, and they're going to be resistant for a couple different reasons. One, because being on the computer feels really good to them, it's very stimulating. Two, they are their brains after two hours are now very stressed out. Their physiology is mimicking the computer game. And that has decreased their window of tolerance. That has increased their stress, therefore increased their confused, distorted thinking, shut down their short-term memory. So when two hours comes and you say, okay, I said two hours and they don't want to get off, there's a reason they don't want to get off. There, there are mo many, many reasons why they're, they're not wanting to get off. They're probably not going to get off in that moment, and that needs to be fine. That needs to be okay with you. Because what you need to do, and this is, this is how you set an effective limit, because the child says, no, 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 please, 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 just five more minutes, five more minutes, please, 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 please. And what that does is that taps into your, what's it tap into? Your parental guilt. Because now, You've just been exposed to the potential of being a bad parent. Or, all my friends get to play their computer games on Saturdays as long as they want. Why are you being mean to me? Why are you making me get off the computer right now? This is not fair. Just let me finish this game. Blah, 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 blah. As soon as you get triggered into the parental guilt, because that's almost nine times out of ten always why we don't maintain we can set an effective limit, but we don't maintain it. So there's more than just setting it. You have to maintain it. Then as you maintain it, you reinforce it. And then you have to have repetition. And the repetition is what you go into realizing that you're going to need to do over and over and over again. So... The child says, please, 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 just five more minutes. And your response has to be, honey, I'm sorry I didn't give you enough transition time. I probably should have told you that two hours was coming up ten minutes ago. No, it's not fair. I understand that you're upset. I also understand that I probably have let you be on it a little too long. So next time... We'll cut it down to an hour and 45 minutes because that might help. And we will, I will give you a warning at, at 10 minutes. But right now, I need you to go ahead and put the, put the game down. And then you walk away. See, that is setting, maintaining, reinforcing the limit right there. It doesn't mean you go rip the game out of the child's hand. That's not the point. See, you have to remember, in all instances, you want to try to, you want to try to maintain the security of the relationship. So you don't want to become a threat in all instances. What I just said was completely non-threatening. So now the child is left to kind of contend with that on their own because I just walked away. Guess what? I don't expect them to put the video game down. I expect them to keep playing it because it feels too good. They're too stressed. They're, their short-term memory shut down. But what I don't want to be into is I don't want to be into parental guilt. I want to be into the process of teaching my child effective limits. And, and for myself as a parent, being able to reinforce the, the limits. 
So I'm going to wait five minutes maybe. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to say, honey, you've exceeded the two hours. I need you to put the game up. And I understand that you want to keep playing it. And you know what? You might want to go ahead and keep playing it. But I just want you to know that I've asked you to put it down. And when you can't put it down, when I ask you to, that tells me that being on that game is too stressful. And that makes me feel like a really bad parent. And it's my responsibility in the future to only allow you to play that game to the degree that you can handle it. And then you walk away again. You must, you should be prepared to let your child play that game all day long if they sit there on that game and they play it all day long. Does that sound crazy? It's not. It's the most rational thing you can do because you have planted the seed. You have planted the seed for what is expected. And you have followed it up. And you just wait another 10 minutes going about your day. And you go past your child again, and I'm just assuming the child is still playing the game. You say, I need you to put it down. Now, let's see, what if you have somewhere to go? Maybe there's somewhere you got to get ready to go to. Okay, so then you're going and you're saying, now, honey, I understand that you're going to keep playing this game, and that makes me really sad because I know that you're pretty stressed out right now. But we need to get ready. So would you take the game into your room and go ahead and get your clothes on? And that's exactly probably, in some instances, exactly what they'll do. You get ready to leave? It's up to you. You say, I need you to leave the game here. Or you know that I don't want you playing with the game any longer. But I understand you're exerting yourself. You're going to do what you feel like is in your best interest. And I'm going to support you in that. But it's just teaching me, it's just reinforcing to me that you cannot handle playing this game. See, the thing is, the child can't play the game forever. So when the child finally puts the game down, even if it's at midnight, even if they fall asleep with the game exhausted. Listen to, listen to me. Follow me here. Follow me here. They have now, I mean, even if they play the game until they're exhausted and they fall asleep, if they play the game for three days straight, three days straight, follow, follow my logic here. So you're getting overwhelmed and you don't have to. It's not that big a deal. They're not going to die. So see, you. this is why you have to be able to be mindful of your own fear. They're not going to die. They're not going to die. So the world's not going to end. There's nothing that's so important that you have to force that game out of their hands and become a threat and make this about you. Don't do it. If you want to create, if you want to create the relationship that is going to move you towards Sustained communication and understanding, this is the process you have to follow. When that game eventually gets put down, your, your child's own guilt is going to kick in. Their own shame. In, in, in fact, the mo moment to moment, the guilt and their, their guilt and their shame has, has come up throughout the, the times when you say, honey, I really need you to put it down. It really hurts my feelings that you don't. See, that, the, that's allowing them to experience their own guilt and shame by communicating your feelings. That's not making them feel guilty. That's not shaming them. It's only communicating your feelings, therefore naturally allowing their own guilt and shame to kick in, which guilt and shame are very healthy. It's when we've been made to feel guilty and ashamed that's not okay. Okay, so when they finally put the game down, then you're going to take the game and you're going to put it up. And you're going to put it up until you decide to let them play the game again. And you should let them play the game again within another day even. The very next day. But this time, you say, yesterday, it was really hard. I'd really allow you to play your game. But yesterday was really hard for you. Can we talk about that for a moment? 
what what was it about the game that was feeling so good to you yesterday that you weren't a, that you were unable to listen to to what I asked you to do? And there's no blame in there. There's no threat in there. It's just conversation. Because I know you really love that game, and I really want you to be able to play that game. But honey, don't you see? You know, because they're gonna they're gonna argue for what they think. You know, what, what they think is gonna you know get them secure them the game again. Uh, honey, don't you think? that I'm probably not being the best parent if I let you play a video game all day long. Wouldn't you trust that I've gotten you this far? I probably have some idea for, for how, how much is good for you and how much isn't. So you're just having a conversation. And so then you say, well, I'd love for you to play your game again. But this time I'm going to let you play it for an hour. Two hours is obviously way too long. So I'm going to let you play it for an hour. Now 50, 50 minutes, I'll put the egg timer on. 50 minutes, I'm going to let you know it's time to start closing it down. You have 10 minutes to close it down. Can we agree on this? All right, I'm, I'm excited. Let's try it. And so then you try it again. And then you actually hope, you actually hope that your child doesn't put it down in an hour. See, see, how, see how beautiful that is? That is a fantastic learning experience. You could potentially learn how to set an effective limit by just one day of process. One day, how many days do parents go? How many years do parents go with their children and, and, and they're unable to establish effective limits? It's because they don't want to put in the work. They don't want to deal with the guilt that goes into setting, maintaining, and reinforcing, creating repetition around the limits. That's the only problem. So children learn that no doesn't mean no. No only means no until I ask. Ten more times, and at ten, then I'm going to get a yes. And then the parent has completely lost the ability to set the effective limit. So it's, that's very important. I mean, I see that happening so often, and, and it starts at very young ages, very young ages. I remember Marley's mother and I one morning, we were uh, in our little beach house, and Marley was sitting on the floor, and she was probably two years old. She may have been three, but she wanted some cereal. And Christy said, no, Marley, no, no cereal. No cereal this morning. Marley's, I want cereal, cereal, Mommy, cereal. And, and, and Christy said, no, we're, we're about to eat. We're, you know, we're about to eat dinner, and blah, blah, blah. I want cereal. So here's the thing. Here's the, the thing about this. Had Christy said, okay, you can have some cereal, it would have been fine. It would have been fine. I mean, it, who cares, you know, if she gets the cereal, but it's when you say no cereal that you can't then go back. And so she says no cereal, and Marley keeps asking for the cereal, the cereal, the cereal. And before you know it, Christy says, okay, just a little bit of cereal. And I remember standing there cringing. Going, oh no, you can't do that. It's so interesting. Because that's when it starts. It starts that young. It starts that young. Of course, Marley is, you know, she's we've we've turned that curve, that, that corner pretty well. Marley, uh, she is just fine with limits. She has no issue with limits whatsoever. But that is the dynamic that goes into parents not being able to maintain limits. And then, you know, there's the other part for the child. And this is the other part of parental guilt. This is where parents want to shut the, shut the parent down. The parents want to shut the child down. Because we feel like there's something wrong with the child asking. There's not. There's nothing wrong with the child asking. There's nothing wrong with the child asking 100 times. In fact, my son Donnie, he'll be at often, when I pick him up from school, he'll say, can we get ice cream? Because every now and then we'll get ice cream. Or he'll say, can I get a lemonade? And every now and then we'll get a lemonade. But sometimes I'll just say, no, not today. I'm not, I don't want to set a precedence for going to get ice cream and lemonade every day after school. I'm not going to set a precedence for that. And so every day we're not going to do it. And he says, you know, I really, you know, he'll get in the, get in the truck and he'll say, oh, my gosh, 
I really thirsty. I really need something cool and refreshing to drink. And I was like, great, I brought this ice water here just for you because I knew you were going to be thirsty. You can have some ice water. Or we'll be home in just a minute. I'd be happy to fix you a nice, cool, uh, sparkling beverage called water. And he's like, no, I don't want, I want lemonade. And so he regresses literally to about an infant. I want lemonade. And I said, you should say it louder. And he'll say it louder, and he doesn't quite get what I'm doing at that point. I'm, can you say it a little bit louder? And he'll scream it louder. I was like, that's great. You were really good. And then, like, then I'll be like, can you say it louder than that? And he'll, he'll say it a little, a little quieter. And I'm like, what happened? What happened? And then by then we're all like halfway home, and so he realizes that, you know, so there's not going to be an eliminate. And, He's going to be fine. He's not going to die. But here's the problem. Parents don't like for kids to do that because it triggers their parental guilt. And when it triggers their parental guilt, that's when they struggle. So they don't want their child to ask. They just want their child to take no for an answer. And how many of us, how many of us want to take no for an answer? Not many of us, nor should you. If you really believe that you need something, that your life depends on it, ask for it. But you as the parent have to be able to transcend your parental guilt so you can not become stressed out by the asking because the asking is not the problem. And you don't want to teach your children that's not okay to ask. It is okay to ask. Many of us have learned that it's not okay to ask, so we give up far too easy. Think about us as adults. How many times do you ask for a pay raise? Maybe once your boss says no. What do you do? You never ask again. How many times do you ask um, someone for assistance or for help or, or to meet a need and they say no and then you just go away when in fact what you should have done is ask again and ask again and ask again how many of really successful people people who have become really successful have you heard that they've sought out a mentor and the mentor has said no and the next day they are back on the mentor's doorstep at their office and the next day 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 where they call and they call and they call and they call and they keep hearing no, 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 no and they keep calling and they keep calling and they keep calling and finally they get a yes. Well, those are people who learned that it's okay to be told no and to not accept no for an answer. Because, see, it's okay to be told no and figure out some mother creative way to get your need met. So we want to be able to re reinforce the really good stuff when it comes to our children and raising our children because, you know, they, they take these stories into their adulthood. That's why, you know, if we go back to the three pathways of emotional expression, attitudes, feelings, and behaviors, you ask a child to take out the trash and they start rolling their eyes and huffing and puffing and talking back as they're going to take out the trash. That's not the problem. The fact that they're going to take out the trash is victory. The fact that they're rolling their eyes and talking back and huffing and puffing, that's not an issue. That's just them expressing their emotions, getting, getting, it, getting the energy out of their body. So that's what we want to reinforce. The fact that they just listened to us and they went and done what they were supposed to do. So that's, that's setting effective limits in, in every possible way you do that, whether that's with small children, whether that's with teenagers. It's the same dynamic. So you'll need to review that again. You'll need to review that again because that, that, you need repetition around that. You need to really look at that in, in, in you know, raising your own children or grandchildren or, or what, ha what has it or dealing with employees or, or anyone else. All right. So now part of our 16 week program is certification around coaching. So I see a little question. So hang on a moment. It's hopefully it's just a question. And I have a Oh, great. You are welcome, Jeanette, and good morning to you. I know it's very early to you. To you. It's very early for you. So where did that go? All right, so part of our 16-week program is coaching, preparing you all to be certified coaches, so to be able to offer coaching assistance to others. Now, you got to know, if I'm certifying you and I'm saying you are certified, you've got to be able to speak this language. I'm, I'm pretty dogmatic when it comes to this this um, 
philosophy as it's being taught by others. Because if, when you're putting something out in the world, and I've said you're certified, you're now a, an extension of me. So you've got to be able to get these core concepts. You've got to be able to understand this. You've got to be able to listen. You've got to be able to understand. You have to be able to reflect. And then you have to be able to guide and give insights according to this model that we've been sharing for the last 12 weeks. And as you do it, now it's going to take a little time because you're still going to be challenging your own, your own, your own paradigm. But as you do it, you get better and better and better at it, and then it becomes literally the lens through which you see the world. Now, again, I've been studying this information for 15 years. Mm, let's say 14 years. 14 years. I've been a social worker for the last 20 years. So I've been doing this for 14 years. You're getting this in 16 weeks. That's why you have to have repetition. That's why you have to, you have to study the material. And then you have to get out there and get busy. So one of, in, in our next few sessions, are going to kind of move into the coaching component. One of the core dynamics in coaching is listening to what is going on within the family. Because nine times out of ten, if a family comes to you via the, the Post Institute portal or Reclaim Parenting, or that's another website I'm in the process of creating. I plan on my next book. I've got two. I'm probably going to write an education book. Um, but then I'm going to write a book called Reclaim Parenting, which is going to be this whole model pulled together, but it's going to be, you know, for all children. If they come through one of, via one of these portals, they're going, to, they're going to be coming with the focus of the child is a problem because that's how parents show up at our doorstep. The child is a problem. Could very well be there's all kinds of craziness going on in the family. Could, could be that there's all kinds of craziness going on in the child's life, dealing with the school and, you know, rigid psychologists and, and all that business. But nine times out of ten... The child is going to be the identified patient. And the focus for the family is going to be on the identified patient who's a child. So they're going to come to you with all of the, all of the, you know, labels and, and past history and, you know, beliefs about the child being a problem child. And, and you're going to have to guide them through a family understanding. Okay, you're going to have to guide them through an understanding of the overall dynamics, how the overall dynamics impact the child and how the overall dynamics all of the systems involved in the child's life come together to to create impact for the child give me just one moment I need to go below my nose Okay, much better. So let's look at our first um, first slide here. Oh, we're back at the brain. Of course, everyone has a everyone in the family has a brain, correct? So it's not just what's going on with the child's amygdala. It's not just what's going on, you know, with with the with the child's orbital frontal cortex. It's it's ev everyone. 
So you have to listen to that. You have to listen to, you know, what is the foundation of oxytocin? What, what is the foundation of regulation in a family? Can you answer that? What is what is the foundation of oxytocin and regulation? in the family. What is the foundation? Of course this will be a quiz question. I'm such an easy teacher, aren't I? Like I'm always telling you what's what's gonna be a quiz question and what's not. Um, I'm, I'm like the classic open book professor. It's all open book. No one needs to get stressed out over over a test. And, and the bottom line is you either want to learn the material or you don't. So if you don't want to learn it, I don't want you being stressed out about, you know, getting the right answer. I just want you to have the answers and move on. I used to, um, in my lectures, I would literally put the certificates on the table before the talk. And I would say to the audience, look, everyone's got their certificate. If you really don't want to be here, you don't even have to come back at lunch or you can take off after a break. You've paid your money. If you don't want to learn, Go home. Go, you know, go do something else that's more effective for you. And I, you know, I would never have people leave. Occasionally, I'd have someone come up and say, "Okay," because I always also used to say, "I want you to take three things from the day." Occasionally, I'd have someone come up and say, I, took, "I got three really good things, and I really need to go." And I'd be like, "Hey, cool, take off. You know, no sweat off my back. The sooner you guys are out of this room, the sooner I don't have to talk anymore." <laughs> oh, just I don't know. I, I got issues. Anyway. What is the foundation of oxytocin in a oxytocin regulation in family? It's the parental system. The parental system. So who forms? Who forms the foundation of oxytocin in, regu in regulation in the family? It's the parents. Now what about, oops, in the back. What about in a just I'm just gonna throw throw this one in on you. Trip you up a little bit. What about in a residential treatment center? In a residential treatment center, who forms the foundation of oxytocin regulation? Did you get it? The direct care staff. They form the foundation. It's the adult. At the end of the day, no matter how you cut it, no matter whoever, whoever it is in whatever situation, it's the adult that forms the foundation of oxytocin regulation in the family. It's the adult system. So when you start working with families, you want to keep that in mind. You want to keep that in mind as you're listening to the dynamics. So what I like to do is I like to start off before before we even before we're even you know before we even get into talking about the child. And a lot of times I let parents discuss the child as a as a way of just building relationship, just establishing you know some mutual understanding and breaking the ice and I'll let them tell me about all the you know all the problems they're having with the child and and, and you know kind of on and on and when they got the child ask them questions like when they got the child and we'll we'll um, one of my sessions one of our sessions here I will share with you a, a fam we'll go through a family evaluation that families have to fill out in order to do coaching that you can also take and, and utilize yourself I'll share that with you but they're just they're asking exploratory questions and sometimes you'll get good information sometimes you get short inf short short you know and not not enough information and it's never all there is you know once you get into it it always there always becomes more so as i am 
asking questions and listening to them discuss history, the child's history, what have you. I'm always, I'm always listen, listening. And, uh, you know, I, I ask questions. I ask questions that are essentially non-threatening to the average person. Just like, well, what was, what, do you know anything about their history? You know, do you know anything about their birth? You know, kind of where were you guys living? Um, when you adopted the child, how was you guys' relationship? And, you know, they, they can give pretty easy answers. Or they, sometimes they'll give you know, more accurate answers. But what you have to understand is that all of these, these issues, marital, generational, generational, financial, parental, spiritual, all of these are potential family disruption factors. And you, you want to be able to assess for these in the midst of, you know, your conversation, your coaching, your coaching relationship. Now, as I'm, set, I'm, as I'm setting here, I, 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 there's this, I have just made a very distinct break in moving into coaching and, and getting out of the parenting stuff. So it's almost like, my, my own brain is having a little shift. So, you know what? I think I'm going to, let me just, I'm going to back up here. Because this is all, this is all very important. But I, I want to make a clean, I want to make a clean distinction um, from the parenting stuff um, and, and on, on to the coaching stuff. And so, are there any questions? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up on I'm gonna pick up on the the the, the coaching dynamics. I'm gonna pick up on that on the, in the next session. So rather than kind of transition into that, because we we're we're nearing our one hour, let's not transition into that because that's a whole different kind of mindset. Are there any questions on any of this? And if just if you have a question, just you can type it in. You can type it in, you know, in, into the little question box, and they'll pop up. And if it's after, if you're listening to this after the fact, then you just email me. It's a it's an a Brian post at one at gmail.com. Because the whole setting limits thing, that's a lot of information. It takes a, it takes a, lot, of, it takes a lot of repetition. It takes a lot of process. So give it an, another example of setting effective limits. Okay. Give me a situation. Just a, just a, a rough little one, one, one sentence situation of where you feel like you might have difficulty setting, setting a limit or a challenge. Because to me, <laughs> Rhoda, to me, all of the, all of the, all of the, it all becomes the same. I mean, I, it all becomes the same. I mean, I can literally, um, I just see I see the situations all very similar. So if you could just, you know, send me a little quick, quick example, I'd be happy to kind of dig into it for you. His homework within a healthy timeline. Okay, getting my son to sit down and do his homework within a healthy timeline. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to just shrink the box down here. Okay, the first thing we want to look at is healthy timeline. What does that mean? What kind of stress gets, gets created when we start thinking about a healthy timeline? What does that mean to us? What kind of dynamic gets created, internal dynamic gets created? 
So usually that means before 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And we want to look at going into the interaction with our child, what that looks like. So see, to me, right away, we are... We are, we've already set ourselves up for stress, and we've already set ourselves up to get our child to need to do something. See, this is a classic example of saying this within a healthy timeline is not about our child. That's about us. It's about what we determine to be a healthy time, timeline. Now, we could say, you know, we could give all kinds of rationale. Well, yeah, I want him to get it done before midnight because he needs to be able to get to sleep. No, 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 no. See, we all have to learn to operate within rhythms that, that work for us. We all have to learn to take responsibility. So you want to create a scenario to where you're not the one who's being the enforcer. So this is, this is the, the situation. You don't want to be an enforcer. The enforcer is a threat. See, you end up, the moment you become the enforcer, you end up making getting the homework um, not about getting the homework. You end up making it about you. See, this is one of the big problems that parents have when it comes to setting limits. When we start to create stress, then we are making the issue about us and not about the issue. So the child's focus, who becomes the threat in the child's mind, becomes about uh, we become the threat and, and, and not the getting the thing done. It needs to always stay on getting the thing done. So your child comes home. You know he's got homework. What you want to do is you want to set up, a routine, because see, we all need structure, and that's the best way to ultimately be able to set effective limits. You want to be able to create a structure around when homework gets done. So homework needs to be done by 5 o'clock. If your child gets home by 3, homework needs to be done by 5. So what goes on between between 3 and 5 is what's going to set your child up to be able to do the homework at 5 and get have it done by 5 versus not have it done by 5. So at 3 o'clock, your child comes home, he eats some food, he gets on the video game, or, or he goes out and he starts playing with friends. Now, he's already being set up not to be able to get his homework done by 5. Because now he's already engaged in things that are, are, are relieving his stress from his stressful day. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why I do not like homework. I'm not an advocate for homework. I don't believe it accomplishes anything. I believe that all schoolwork needs to be done in schools, but we know schools don't operate that way. So, now that we have set the structure that it has to be done by 5, we have to get this homework done by 5, guess what? At 4.30, you say, okay, honey, it's time to come in and get our homework done. I don't want to get a lot of I understand, I understand, I understand. I hear you. I know it. I'll help you. We'll get it done. You can get back to doing what you need to do. So, you know, you put that out there. You know, as, as creating that, that mutual that mutual regulatory relationship. Your child either does it or he doesn't. Five o'clock comes, you go out, you find him, you go to him, you say, son, you know, we really work hard to try to get that homework done by five, and it's not done, and I can appreciate the fact that you just are really tired and you don't want to do it. And, it's, and immediately he's got to melt down. And that's got to be okay. See, you, you, have, you have to make this about the process. You have to make this about the process, not about the outcome. That's what setting effective limits is all about. It's about a process. It's about teaching our children. It's about repetition, setting, maintaining, reinforcing repetition. But it's a process because the, the goal is to get him to do his homework every day, every day by 5 o'clock until he's 18 years old, okay, until, until you just, until it's no longer an issue for you. So, you want to have that point of reference at 5 o'clock. And then guess what? You go right back to what I said with, with the other example. Okay, son, you know, it's, it's 7 o'clock. No, we're not going to watch any television. We're not going to watch any television because we, we still have homework to do. 
No, we're not going to do this. No, we're not going to do that because we still have all these home, all these this homework to do. It still hasn't gotten done. So once it finally gets done, or it doesn't get done, you know, maybe that's maybe it just doesn't get done, and he goes to school the next day and he had, had, didn't, didn't get his homework done. That's okay. That's all right. That's not the end of the world. But the next day, you say, "Okay, son, you know, I let's have a conversation here because I really want you to be able to play and I really want you to be able to have a good time after school." And I because I know how stressful school is and you spent so much time, you know, blah 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 blah. But yesterday you weren't able to get your homework done by five, and five is when we need to be able to get that homework done because that's when I feel like that's a healthy time frame and that's me being a good parent. I want to be a good parent. So to let you not get your homework done makes me feel like a bad parent. I don't like to feel like a bad parent. Do you want me to be a bad parent? Usually they'll say no. And of course they could say I don't care. It just depends on your child. And any answer is acceptable. Because it's all about you taking responsibility. That's the communication. So then you, what you are doing is you're setting up a non-threatening communication around getting homework done. So, so it's... We need to get it done by five. So yesterday I let you go out and play, you know, or I let you play on your video games and you weren't able to you weren't able to transition. So today, instead of, you know, playing or playing your video games or doing whatever until four thirty, until five, until four thirty, we're gonna we're gonna go at four. So at four, we're gonna need transition. Transition out of out of, you know, doing whatever we're doing. We're gonna need to take a break. And then we're going to need to get our homework done. The sooner we get our homework done, the sooner you can go back and, you know, go finish your plan. Now, if you need me to help you, I'm happy to help you. It, it, you know, if there is homework, this is a side note, if there is homework, help your child with the homework. Not only is it a great time for regulation, mutual co-regulation, it's a great time for attention. It's, it's a great time for, for communication. It's a great time for just, just collaboratively working together. So... As a parent, help your child with their homework in all instances for as long as you can. Help them with their homework. The younger the child, do the homework. The young children, do it for them. Have them write the answer. Get it done. It's just not that important. It's not that important. So you don't want to create more stress and more threat than you have to. Okay? Don't, don't invite more stress and threat into your home when you don't have to. So then you let your child go up to 4 o'clock, and at 4 o'clock, they've still not been able to do it. Then you say, you know, you just, you, 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 you take it, you make a mental note. Because what may eventually happen is that they don't go outside and play. They don't go, they don't go get on the computer until after 5 o'clock, until after homework stuff. So you say, honey, I know how stressful it is. So why don't you just take, here's some food, make sure they have food, and, you know, after school. Because they've probably eaten crap at school because, you know, school cafeterias, and unless you send your, your child to, to school with lunch, which is always the best thing to do, um, you just say, why don't you just take some quiet time, go in your room and hang out and play um, until we get our homework done. At any point you want me to help you, just let me know. But, you know, it's, 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 it's too stressful for you to go out and play before homework's done. It's too stressful for you to be on the computer before the homework's done. It's too stressful for you to blank, blank, blank. And if I let you do that, then I'm being a bad parent. Jeanette, does that make sense? Are you, are you following me, you know, through, through, this, through this example? You know, is there, there more to that that you, want, that you want me to add? So, see, now it becomes, because your child has demonstrated that they don't have the window of tolerance, to transition to getting the homework done by five, then you're you're less you're lessening the threat. You're lessening the overwhelm from the time they get home. So from the time they get home until homework's done, really there's nothing going on except them just hanging out. You know, when when you create that dynamic, then what you have set as a healthy time frame for getting homework done, you could now approach it without stress. You can now approach it without fearfulness. And then it's just repetition from there. Anytime you engage in wanting to change a behavior, anytime you engage in wanting to set a precedent around behavior, the thing to do 
is to give yourself at least two weeks. Make that your focus. Make that your focus. Make that your point of reference for at least two weeks. That way you can, you've got two weeks before you need to see an outcome. See, too, too many times we get focused on just outcome. But give yourself two weeks. You have two weeks before you need to see an outcome, and then that way you can approach it. It typically doesn't take that long. See, the, the, brain, the brain doesn't need that long to start to lay down. It's just like when you walk out through the grass. You know, you can walk out through the grass once, and there's a, there's a pathway established. Now, is the pathway going to be reinforced? Is it going to be you know, really worked into a full pathway? Not necessarily. That's going to take more repetition. So now, I got another one. Here's a question. If you have, if, if yes, we have time. How to help an 18-year-old be home on time now that she can drive alone, she is generally two hours late at least coming home. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So what is she doing? She's demonstrating that she's not 18 when she is actually behind the wheel because she is losing her ability to keep in mind the limit that's been set for when she needs to be home. So that's what's got to be communicated. Honey. I'm worried because I've told you that you need to be home by 8 o'clock. But consistency, and this is where we fail, parental guilt. This is where we fail to reinforce the limits. If she's consistently being home two hours late, then you, she's telling you that she is consistently unable to maintain her regulatory state enough to be home on time. So now you have a stressed out child behind the wheel. See, sometimes it could be as simple as saying to the child, bringing to their consciousness, look, here's what I'm seeing. I've asked you to be home at 8 o'clock, and you're not getting home till 10. You know what that tells me? That tells me you are too stressed out right now to even be driving. That letting you just be out there driving by yourself may not be the safest thing. If you cannot be home by 8 o'clock when the limit's been set, that tells me that your, your brain is not operating in a way that will allow you to remember the limit. So that tells me you're stressed out because your short-term memory shut down. So let's look at this again. Let's, let's reevaluate this. And this is a non-threatening conversation. Very simple. It's a quick conversation. It doesn't have to be a lengthy conversation. This conversation should take, should take no longer than two to three minutes. It could be a statement. Honey, before you go out, let me, can I, I need to point out something. I've asked you to be home by 8. You've consistently not come back till 10. You know what that tells me? That tells me that you're pretty stressed out when you're driving. And I can appreciate that because driving is a pretty stressful experience. But what that also tells me is that you're not safe. Because if you're that stressed out that you can't remember when to be home, you're probably not safe enough to be driving. So I'm going to give it one more chance because I'm not sure if maybe, you know, you just haven't heard me clearly enough. But I'm going to give you one more chance to be home by 8 o'clock. If you can't be home by 8 o'clock, that tells me you're not ready to be out there for that length of period of time. We're going to need to push, we're going to need to pull that back probably by at least an hour, and I'm going to need you to be home by 7. If you can't do that, then I'm going to need to start driving with you again. And I really don't want to be driving with you again because I'm excited for you to be out there driving by yourself because I don't have to be driving you. I'm happy, happy, happy for you to be driving yourself. But... If I have to, because I love you and I want to keep you safe. If I have to, I'll ride with you again, and we'll go ride all over town until it's 7.30, and then we'll start heading back home. That way I can teach you what that means. Or before we get to that point, maybe I need to start texting you at 7.30. Would that help? Would it help if I start texting you at 7.30 to, to give you a little reminder that it's time to start heading home? I, may, I know that may seem silly and that may be a little frustrating for you, but I want to be a good parent. I don't want to be a bad parent, honey. So will that help? So you see the communication here? It's, it's, you want to create consciousness. And there's a difference between create, creating a threat versus creating consciousness. Creating a threat is if you're not home by 8 o'clock, that tells me that you're not listening to what I'm telling you. Therefore, you're not going to get to drive anymore. Or... I'm going to cut that time back to 7 o'clock. 
But see, what you're doing when you say that is you're not taking any responsibility in the dynamic, and then what is occurring is your child is now seeing you as a threat instead of seeing you as a responsible parent. That's not what you, you don't want to create that because that's typically going to get your child now not coming home till 11 o'clock. So you don't want to create a threat in the dynamic. You want to create a dynamic. And that's why I say the communication doesn't need to take longer than just a couple of minutes. You want to create some consciousness. You want to give some solutions. And then you want to be able to give your, give your child a chance to be able to process that. Before you, before you move, before you, you know, move to the next level of taking responsibility. And so I would start, that's kind of how I would start. Especially with an 18-year-old adolescent. Because I think it's probably just a consciousness issue, but the texting at 730 would probably be really good. Or you could start requiring a phone call. Require a phone call at 730. Anything you can do to start to reset the, the, the resonant memory. Require a phone call, you know, uh, you know, do something that's interrupting whatever stressful things you may be experiencing. You're welcome, Jeanette. You're welcome, Rodan. Thanks for sharing those examples. Anything that you can do to start to reset the resonant memory. See, the resonant memory is, is, is the external regulatory source that we oftentimes don't tap into. So, you know, in anything you can do, and it's just like with sibling, right, with, with, with kids, you know, kids can, can play, um, you know, two kids can play. I'll give you a good little review. I need to send this to you all so you'll have it also. Um, let me see. So kids can play for a period of time before the parent has to has to come in and and has to um, you know say how you guys doing check on them what have you or 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 else they they'll start fighting they'll start fighting with one another and then that's not going to be good so we we want to create resonant memory opportunities and now you know you're seeing you're watching these slides I'm the, there's a quiz question there resonant memory opportunities resonant memory opportunities and that is when you create a situation where you interrupt the child's stress with just a statement. It could be with a demonstration of affection. It could be a smile. It could be a phone call. It could be a text. Anything you can do to kind of interrupt their, their, their window of tolerance, their stress. And so with the 18-year-old, with, with the, the young kid finished, the, the young child finishing, um, finishing their, their information, finishing their homework, you know, at, at 4 o'clock, it could be a little reminder. So it's like a reminder. You know, creating those resident memory opportunities, really just reminders. And that's what they do. That's what a reminder does. It creates a little resident external memory opportunity. So we can have that right there. It's like gets it fresh in our short-term memory again. So God bless each and every one of you. Hope you enjoyed this session. It's the end of session 12. And, um, Look forward to talking to you in our next class. Have a fantastic weekend.